Uh, and the topic we're going to talk about today is, uh, after I sent this title to Anna, I was like, this is awful. Uh, so multi-level co-authoring educational resources, collaborating with students for the creation of course materials. And so then I was like, let's just call this what it is, uh, which is writing nice free textbook. <laughs> um, and that's really kind of what it's, it's turned into. So we got the funding um, late last spring, and uh, things got off to a bit of a, a slow start. Um, and now things, I think, are really going quickly. It's been pretty exciting. All right, so um, Vicky talked about this a little bit, uh, but uh, we had kind of a, a team here that started off with uh, looking at the Provost Affordable Instructional Resources Initiative, which is, I, I don't actually remember how I heard about this. Um, Lauren, maybe you emailed me at some point. I don't remember. Um, but uh, but um, so these were a, a, a series of grants, competitive grants uh, that were offered last spring that a grant is anywhere between 2.5 and uh, 5K in order to develop an open educational resource or use an educational resource. And this has changed a little bit during the second iteration. But the idea is that we want to be able to create a free um, text that can be distributed online and then under, uh, under a license that allows it to be copied and adapted in any way, okay? Um, and so we wrote a proposal and that was a proposal that would have the most impact, we thought, for our students so I teach a class um, twice a year, uh, which is math side uh, 201, 301. We actually combined it now. This is our introductory undergraduate course, and it serves um, over 300 students a year. The text we use is excellent, uh, but it costs $250. Uh, and um, so if you do the math, that ends up to be about $90,000 a year in student expense um, uh, if they bought this textbook, which they, they don't, but um, if they don't steal the textbook. Um, and so we were hoping that we could come up with uh, both a, a, a text that was um, more suited to how we teach the class, as well as one that we're happy to apply to students. Um, so we wanted to develop uh, a textbook for that course, and we'll talk about that very briefly. Um, but what our big, bigger idea was, was to develop kind of a scalable co-authoring workflow and process. So how can we, how can we make this happen uh, you know, in different disciplines or different uh, courses within our own department? So that everyone can, you know, work together to, to create these textbooks. So we wanted to create this scalable uh, authoring workflow, and then uh, evangelize the approach, which I guess is what we're doing now. And then um, uh, during uh, TeachX, I guess in uh, a month or two, uh, I'll present something like this again. So the team here, um, uh, that's me. I'm kind of uh, spearheading it in some ways. Um, Chris has been working a lot with respect to uh, with respect to developing. Which has been really amazing, uh, and then Ken Scholl, uh, he's a, a tenured professor in our department, and he actually was a little bit ahead of the game here. He's been working on something like this probably for the past five years, um, and uh, and we can talk about his role a little bit more. But he's really the one that even before um, even before uh, the program thought about this, kind of was thinking about this quite a bit. I guess. Okay, so um, so this is where we're going to go. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples. So first is, uh, let's just look at a conventional text here. So this is kind of what we're, we're aiming. I teach a class called Base Delivered Education Materials. Um, the text was actually developed uh, previously by a professor named Thomas Mason. And it's in a PDF form, kind of a conventional format. I'm trying to navigate over here while looking. Okay. Okay. And so you can see, I'm just, I took a video uh, of this where you scroll through, and this is all the topics that we teach in the class. It's got a course description, which shows up, you know, the same as if you go in the registrar's packet. We have nice figures, equations, everything uh, that we need in order to teach basic programs undergraduate. Okay, so this is really good. This is a PDF version, um, and we're, we're pretty proud of this, and students use this in the course, right? So this is now deployed. Um, we also have uh, something that's a little bit, um, more modern, and I don't think I'll click on the link here, but uh, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit. This is what, uh, this is a digital format of uh, a similar type of textbook. So Chris has actually developed an open educational Northwestern resource template um, using a program called Bookdown. And this is really amazing. So instead of, you know, we're using PDF where it's really difficult to get advanced kind of interactivity, now anything that you can do on the web, you can do within this module. So we've developed 3D graphics that you can just embed directly into this book. You have situations where you can get, you know, essentially response forms from students, or you can have uh, 
a little, um, uh, you know, if I have a problem or an example and I don't want them to look at the solution right away, you know, you can have them activate that solution and kind of pop up within the web page itself. So Chris has spent a lot of his time working on getting this into a way that, you know, I'm not a digital publishing expert, but I can come through uh, and start editing this text myself uh, and creating this product. Okay, so there's five steps to this process. Um, and so the first step, if you guys are thinking about writing an OER, the first step is really identifying a candidate course for your OER. So I'm gonna talk about our core a little bit later and not all of the courses that we have are really, really suitable for this at this time. There's a lot of factors that go into this decision. Um, so, you, you know, while you guys are sitting there and looking at what we're able to produce today, I want you to be able to, you know, I want you to think about, you know, can I do this in a course that I teach or that I'm involved in? And then the next one is to win an affordable instructional resources mission <laughs> grant, uh, right, due February 19th or so, Chris? March 9th. March 9th, okay, so you got a little more time. Um, and in the workflow that we've developed, you need help, right, because what I've found is if I try to do everything myself, if I try to write a textbook myself, plus my normal job, it doesn't happen. And so uh, you get help. So you hire work-study students, or you can script graduate students, uh, and you can entice them one way or another, um, but you're gonna build a team. So this is where the multi-level component of the, of the offering comes into play. You're going to have students that are working at different levels, all the way down from, I have first-year undergraduate students helping me write textbooks, and they're listed as co-authors, all the way up to, um, you know, tenure faculty that's been around. Um, and then you've got to organize the project. So you, because these people, you know, the students are work-study students, the graduate students have other responsibilities as well. My main job at this point uh, in building a textbook is actually organization, right? Giving them jobs to do so that they can fill up their 10 hours per week with, with making a uh, nice, uh, nice product. So um, when you organize the product, product projects, there's a couple things you have to do. Um, we have to make graphics and we have to write words. And so we have to figure out uh, how to typeset, and there's a couple of different options that we have here. How do you get a nice equation? You know, we're not we're not going to use Word. Um, we're going to use something else. Uh, but how do you get a nice? How do you get an equation to show up nicely? How do you get a chemical equation to show up nicely? In the engineering field, this of course shows up all the time. How do you get graphics that are consistent with what you're trying to show in the rest of the text? We want to produce a nice resource for our students. And then uh, you want to create the template. So once you've identified what type of tools you want to use, you're going to create template files so students don't have to do all the, the groundwork, or at least maybe we help you create the template files. They don't have to do all the groundwork. They can come in and start writing. Okay? Uh, and then uh, I've found that it really helps for me to run uh, workshops for my work study students. So I tried this in the fall without uh, workshops, and um, they, were, they were pretty lost. Uh, and so I actually run a software orientation workshop um, uh, Chris came in and gave a copyright intellectual property workshop. Um, because of the way that this works, we'll find that there's a lot of material that comes from sources that it is stolen. Okay, so, uh, so we have to be really careful about that. Um, and then one that I want to do that I haven't yet is actually accessibility training. So when you're producing these textbooks, um, one thing that I don't think about very much is how it's accessible to all my students, right? Um, and I run into this problem all the time because I co-teach really frequently with uh, a professor who's colorblind, and I make these like really good looking figures, and then he's like, I can't tell anything that's going on in this figure, so I have to adapt it. So actually, I'm very interested in, in thinking about that in the future, too. And then uh, once, you've, once you've done that, you take, uh, take your entire idea, right, kind of a, a bird's eye view, and then you want to organize it in specific project tasks. So we'll see what that looks like uh, very explicitly in a minute. So that's the first step. That's you kind of sitting down, thinking about thinking about what this is going to look like. The next is that we are actually trying to adapt over um, course material, and we're, it's a little bit different in materials science than it may be in in some other areas. But um, we have classes that really never had a textbook, right? So what they have instead is you know they have an instructor who's giving a lecture. They might have PowerPoint slides. They have notes. And so what our idea is, is to take those notes and put them into a written kind of narrative form. That is step number two. So the instructor gives the lecture, um, he supplies the students with the PowerPoint notes if he has those, or the written notes if he has those. And then the undergraduate work studies come in and they take notes, maybe they videotape, maybe they record. I have students that do all of these. Maybe they're doing this um, in real time on their computer, 
but they're, they're creating what we call a, a skeleton version of the web. This is not, you, you know, a lot of you might be saying, okay, your first year undergraduate engineering student is not going to be able to make the textbook. And you're absolutely right. Um, what they can do is help you get the textbook started, okay? Because um, that's really the, the hardest thing to do, okay? So they come in and I, um, I'll talk about money a little bit, how this actually happens and how we use the, the funds that we've been granted. Um, but they come in and they take the notes, uh, they take the recordings and, and um, try to create what we call a skeleton version of the notes, okay? So they use a number of different tools. Um, is anybody familiar with Lix? Okay, yeah, no one is, <laughs> it's okay. Is anybody familiar with LaTeX? Yeah, so we can do this in LaTeX. Lix is a way that we can do LaTeX without doing LaTeX. It's like, a, it's like Word for LaTeX, essentially. So we have to teach students much less. It's also kind of, you know, Chris is over here smiling a little bit because it's a little bit janky. Um, but it is, uh, it doesn't work. I, I can train students in Lix in about an hour, half an hour, and they're able to, they're able to start. Another option is uh, book down, which uh, I showed a quick example of what Chris put together. And then these are all free softwares, by the way. And then uh, to make nice two-dimensional figures, we're, we're gonna use Inkscape, which is just a vector graphic software, which is very popular and easy to use as well. So I, I note this with a couple of exclamation points because this is really important, but because I, I didn't do this well in the fall. Um, the student that comes in and takes the notes has to produce those notes in a form that I can look at relatively soon or else you know, a part of the way is gone, okay? Um, so so it, there has to be a sort of like weekly or you know, every other day kind of workflow that allows, that forces your work study students and graduate students to produce something quickly while it's fresh. All right, so that's step three. So now once they've produced this set of notes, uh, now it's time for a graduate student or an instructor level um, collaborators to come in and start doing editing or revisions, right? So the, the product that the undergraduates produce is, is not very good, right? It's, it's, um, it's very rough. There's, they don't have much context about what they're looking at, but it is organized in the way that you presented it yourself. And so, um, so they come in, you might have to do a little, you come in, you might have to do a little bit of reorganization of the document. Reorganized document organization, reorganized document. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to change typesetting, right? So, uh, and this is something that I get really picky about. Um, you know, how do you express mathematical variables when you're writing it um, uh, in, a, in a text? Because when I was an undergraduate student, it would change from day to day, right? And I would get so confused about, you know, variable changing that I would spend 20 or 30 minutes trying to figure out what was going on, uh, and that would waste a lot of time. Got to go in and, and fix the figures, of course. Um, add citations and acknowledgments, uh, and then really at this point, you've got to take whatever text that's written and rewrite it in your, in your voice, right? So, while a lot of the workload, a lot of the, the front end stuff is going to be put onto the students, the next step, and I found success with this in one of the courses already, is to take a graduate student to come in and then bump it up one level, right? So. They're able to help the undergraduates and then improve, uh, improve the content before it gets to the instructor. So it kind of reduces the energetic barrier that you need to take up each one of these steps. So then we rewrite the text. And then uh, in the end, uh, you can request input from colleagues or topical experts. So in one of the classes that I work with, we have a student that, um, we have a graduate student that's helping edit the text. And then I look at the, and I get it into a pretty good form and then I send it to uh, the guy that's been teaching the class for 30 years. Right, and then he makes it really beautiful. Okay, if he has time. All right, so uh, so that's the editing and revision kind of step in the workflow. Um, we're going to use a program, or we're going to use a, an interface called GitHub. Has anybody used this before? Okay, so really, this is developed for people that were developing code, um, and it's a way of controlling and understanding what's happened to versions of your code, right? So let's say I'm writing a bit of code, I make it pretty good, Chris comes in, he makes some changes. We want to be sure that we understand what Chris did and that there's a record of that, okay? And then he, you know, sends it for approval and I say, yeah, this is great. Or I say, no, I'm gonna, you know, I want you to do these things. So GitHub has turned into a really, really powerful way um, of making sure that you understand what's happened to a document in this case, as well as, um, as, well as managing the work itself. So 
dishing out tasks and making sure that projects are completed. When I started teaching, what I found out was the most difficult thing is that I would be assigned to teach a course that I had never taught before, right? And then I would get handed a stack of notes or a bunch of PowerPoint slides and I was just completely you know, overwhelmed, right? So um, this allows you to kind of hide things within your, your document itself. So I can, what I do in my, in my document size is I create guides for my TAs. So like this is what you should help students um, these are the concepts that students might get stuck on. This is where you can help them kind of weasel through it. If you're thinking about like solutions for a problem set, um, you can include those uh, in, a hidden, in a hidden way. Um, and actually I include a lot of uh, kind of metadata, including how students have done on um, certain assignments in the past, so I can see if I'm actually improving the way that I teach. Um, the answer is there's not much movement, but, uh, but at least I have the data. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then, uh, and then ultimately what you're going to do is, is publish this. And um, under the, the, the Provost Initiative, uh, we want to publish this in a way that can be, uh, well, it depends on each of the textbooks, I guess, right, Chris? But it can be all the way from you know, a public domain where everybody can just use this and do whatever they want with it, all the way, and then this would be copyrighted, right? So this would be the textbooks that you get from a textbook company. And then there's a bunch of stuff in between including um, share alike, where you can make a derivative work and then share that work. Um, attribution, so um, you made something, someone else takes it, adapts it, but they need to attribute your original work, right? So uh, non-commercial, right? So you, know, no, you can't have a textbook company pick up what you've done and sell it. Um, so, uh, so we have to yet decide, I guess, which one we're gonna publish under when we finish, but, um, but there's lots of options for, what, for what's right for you. And, Okay, so before we jump into the demos, I just want to show quickly, um, this is where we're at in our department with regards to OER. Uh, so this is a pretty, pretty rough map, but green, so this is the status of the textbook. So green is good, uh, red is bad, and orange is okay. Um, so the first one, we, the, the one that we're really working on in the intro class, we think is gonna have the most impact. You can see that the student census is over 300, and we're about here. Right, so this was completely new and completely initialized uh, basically in the fall. We have other texts that are in much better shape. So another class that I teach, which is one of our thermal courses, um, this is pretty much green and the stuff that, uh, you know, there's some stuff that I want to change, but it's, it's in a deliverable format, okay? So this is actually, I'd say this, we distribute this. This is the main text we use in this course. Uh, the same thing for some of our more uh, advanced core courses or pre-16s. We have um, a 314 thermal course that uh, I looked at it and some of it's good, some of it needs a little work, some of it's really bad. So you, you can't distribute this text and not really mess a student, mess a student up. Okay. So we have some other good ones um, that we've actually distributed. There are two that we've, um, we're talking about affordable. So there are two here, 332 and 315, that we've actually uploaded to Amazon uh, and students can pay $20 to get this textbook in a, in a hard format, right? Or they can uh, download the PDF for free. So that's up to them. Um, you know, some students, I personally can't read a textbook uh, electronically, um, but students now apparently can uh, and pr prefer to do so. And so, uh, and so I don't know, we tried this for the first time for 332 uh, in the winter, and I've got to ask Ken if anybody actually bought it, but I imagine they just downloaded it instead. Um, but at least we have the option to do so. So there's really only a couple things that I want students to do. All I want them to do with GitHub is fetch, which means check if any changes were made, pull, which means pull down the changes that were made onto your local computer, commit, this is kind of like telling, telling GitHub that you made a change. Like I made some changes to this system, right? Or I, I, you know, I, changed, the, I changed the equation. But it doesn't mean that you shared it. It's just that you've committed this to memory. It's like, a, like if you play a video game, it's like a checkpoint in a video game, right? And then push, which now you, you're confident that you should be able to share these things, you can push this commit, um, all the changes that you made up into uh, the, the uh, um, repository, the online repository, okay? And then at that point, everybody can see what you've done. So this is, uh, I tried to go further with this before, and really this is it. There's only, they should only be doing four things, okay? More complex things can be done by, um, by others. Um, 
I found if I just tell students to do things, they don't. But if I, <laughs> but if I, if I assign them to do it, right? So I have issues that are you know, controlled by organizing projects, then they do do them because they've got something that actually, and, and you, can, you can actually like, if they haven't done something for a while, you can, send, you can actually say, hey, Luca, what are you doing on this project? Sends them an email and then he's like, oh no, right? And then he gets to work. Um, so, uh, so this is really good. I found this to be extremely useful. And of course, we're happy to add anybody to one of these repositories. You can see how this is structured uh, and duplicated over uh, in a way that suits you. I found that depending on what type of software you need, you really need to sit down with the students and do a basic, basic training, or else um, things get going really slowly. Um, and then what I've also found is work study students are extremely inexpensive. Um, so work study students are supported by the federal government at a rate of 75% uh, their pay and 25% uh, our pay. Um, and so that actually translates into about a $5,000 OER is about a thousand hours of work study uh, effort, which is a lot um, of work study effort. So they can do typically about 100 hours a um, term, right? So you could essentially have three work study students working 10 hours a week for a year on these projects with one of the grants. Um, I'm finding that I'm not even getting close to spending my money, uh, but yeah. I guess that's a good problem to have. Okay, um, and then you know this isn't this isn't a magic bullet, right? Like I'm still spending a lot of time on this, and this is one of the biggest challenges, of course. Um, I'm very invested in this project, but uh, the, the whoever's whoever's running this project also has to be very invested. So a couple of the challenges I've encountered: um, work studies time management is a really the project lead time management is a problem, but work study time management is a, is a big challenge. Um, so I thought this was going to be really easy because last spring I had a senior biology student that basically completed all her requirements. She was just like chopping at the bit, both to learn things uh, as well as uh, get work done. She wanted to go to Machu Picchu. And so, uh, <laughs> so she needed some money. So she was working 10 hours a week. In the fall I hired three freshman engineers um, and they don't have any time. And, uh, sometimes they don't show up. And so, uh, and so I probably need to be a little more careful about the people that I hire. They're very good when they have time, but they don't have time and I don't want their grades to suffer because they're working on a textbook. Um, so, uh, so this term I, I schedule two hours every Friday to come in and work together. It's pretty fun, um, but often they don't do work in between those, those two periods of time. Okay. Um, for, for me, you know, this is interesting to me, so, uh, you know, I, I take the money and I pay my work study students, um, but I had this conversation with other faculty members, at least within my, my apartment, and you can use the money to, you know, a little stipend, I guess. Um, but they're like, you know, shrugging their shoulders at 5K, right? And, and that makes sense, I guess. Um, their time is much, much more valuable than, than 5K. And so, you, you know, when Ken was able, Ken Scholl was able to develop these, these first, um, uh, uh, books, he actually um, he actually had teaching relief to, to do this project. So he had a term off uh, to work on the project. Um, and that was a much more you know, productive route for faculty and so forth. Um, there are definitely higher level technical details. And I think for kind of general consumption, this might not be appropriate for everybody to work at a high level. But the nice thing is that we have people um, that are willing to support this uh, going forward. So. For the book down project, the online distribution of the text, um, I'm only kind of getting started, in, in, but Chris is creating templates for me that are so easy to interface with that I can really not worry too much. And then when I have a problem, I just you know assign it to him on GitHub. He does it. It's amazing. Um, uh, this is something that I've run into a little bit where uh, where we're not quite sure um, what kind of resources that we can use and how we can use them. And so I'm still confused about this. Um, but the libraries know about this as well. Uh, and then, of course, there's this issue of controlling sensitive content. You know, do you want your solutions flying around on the internet? Probably not. Um, so there's ways to, to hide these things in a way that, that students really are never going to be able to find. Okay. And then after it's, it's uh, published, um, version management at that level, we haven't got there, but I can foresee some problems with modular implementation. So if I write a textbook that has 10 modules, but the next instructor only wants to use eight and wants to bring in two new modules, 
There's ways to do this via branches in GitHub. They're essentially split off in, you know, limbs of a tree, um, but we haven't tried it yet. Uh, it makes me a little bit nervous, but I think, uh, I think it can be done. 